rolling with it today. I'm really excited with my guest today. I crossed paths with her after my book came out and thanks to my wonderful PR team. And I just always thought my book was going to do whatever it was meant to do. So I have re met Randy Fine and she is a narcissistic personality disorder expert. She's a coach for over 23 years. So she focuses on what's going on with this. It's kind of a pan, like an epidemic that's happening in the world right now. More and more people are talking about it. She's a compassionate healer for victims and survivors around the world. She is a tireless pioneer in the narcissistic abuse movement. She is a podcast host of A Fine Time for Healing, as well as author of Close Encounters of the Worst Kind, The Narcissistic Abuse Survivor's Guide to Healing and Recovery. Many of her clients have suffered for years and received remarkable results after working with Randy and her coaching techniques. And what I've discovered after having my own uh, realizations is actually there's quite a pattern of narcissism running through our society. I'm getting the chills as I'm saying this right now. It's like a programming that has been going on in for generations in families. Oh my gosh, I'm tingling. Of Woo! So uh, this is why I'm excited to bring you this information because there's a lot of people out there that don't even know they're in these environments and you're modeling the same behavior that was modeled for you. <laughs> so uh, Randy's here to talk about all the different levels. And I just want to introduce you and say hello. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Noelle. It's, it's, it's great to be here. I'm really excited to be here too, because this is a topic that affects everybody. And most people don't even know it does. It's important that everybody understand it. Absolutely. And I, the topic has come up now way more that I've kind of really had it in my forefront. Mm -hmm. I've had multiple people tell me that they've had one parent or both parents be narcissists and asking for help and guidance and coaches and counselors. So this is why I wanted to bring you on because I'm actually referring you out to other people. And it's important that people understand mentally what this processing is and how to address it correctly. So I wanted you to cover, why don't you talk about like the, the types of manipulation tactics that a parent uses with all their types of children, because then kids can see, or people can see where they fall in a line. Hmm. Okay. So let me just say that manipulation from a narcissistic parent begins at birth, day one. They begin conditioning the children to respond a certain way to accept certain um, behaviors from the parent <clears throat> and to know their place. So this is something that is going on all along. And generally until a child reaches adolescence or teenage years or something like that, when they are developing a self, this is where it really becomes a clash because narcissistic parents, their goal or their MO, whatever you want to call it, is to deprive that child of a self. The reason they do this is because they take ownership of their children. All right. And so children aren't children in their own right. Children are their property. So they feel very entitled to do this. And as soon as a child begins to forge this identity, it's like, you know, no, you're not going to do that. So they humiliate them. Um, they get very strict. They start insulting them. Um, they just really create drama around a child's natural progression. Whereas other kids are going through these changes. And we know at adolescence and teenage years that, you know, kids, they don't know who they are. They're, they're, they're exploring this. So this is a point in which they're ashamed for trying to be who they are. But some of the tactics that are used, one of the major ones that we hear a lot about is gaslighting. Gaslighting is when you, when the other person is denying your reality. So they're saying that what you said never happened. 
that what you said happened never happened, that they never said what they what you think they said. They never made these promises. Um, and this is a tactic that's made to make the person feel crazy. And it actually does that over time, the person begins to lose their uh, sense of intuition and they begin to trust this or distrust their own perception, which makes them very vulnerable to being manipulated um, by the parent. Uh, some of the other things that are used are um, infantilization, which is keeping a child young, younger than they are, and so that, again, they're too immature to leave. And in some of these situations, they won't let them go to sleepover parties. They will speak to them in a sing-song voice um, as they're w w way longer than it's appropriate. Um, they will speak for the child. These are some of the things that they do. Um, objectification is something that all narcissists do, and it's really probably the most destructive thing that can happen to a child because with objectification children are not recognized for themselves they are no more than pawns on a chessboard that the parents think they can just move around at will and so children are not loved narcissistic parents do not love their children. They objectify their children. So children aren't people, they're things. Um, and you can imagine how that would, how somebody developing under those restrictions would be, would really suffer. Um, children are, the expectations are that they are to always make this narcissistic parent happy and children res respond different ways to this some children will sort of fall in line become pleasers become you know passive because that buys them some emotional safety some children will dissociate which is they sort of leave their body their mind and go somewhere else so that they can tolerate the situations that they're in um, some children become very rebellious and some children try to become invisible, invisible because if they're invisible, if nobody sees them, there's very little risk because narcissistic parents are ragers. Okay. They get angry at anything, it, it, the littlest criticism and they're, they blow right up. And it's, it's a moving goalpost because even as a child trying to keep that parent happy and trying to pacify that parent, um, they can't because as soon as they figure out what that parent, what they think that parent wants, the goalpost moves. So it's, it, it's, they're always off balance. And so children from these environments grow up without a self, without self-love, self-esteem, um, without tools for survival as far as adults go, um, healthy relationships, what love is, um, they're damaged. And whereas, you know, I know for me, when I went to school, you know, and everybody was turning 18 and we were graduating. And I remember watching everybody just kind of take this upward growth thing. And for me, it was like this, I just plummeted because I didn't have the coping mechanisms. I didn't have the boundaries. I got taken advantage of. I got myself into bad situations. This is very typical for an adult child of narcissistic abuse. Hmm. Okay. It's almost like a self-sabotage. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ah. There's some things I want to actually cover here. This is what I've discovered about narcissism. And then you can address what you want to add into this. Okay, sure. So as I dive deeper, I started watching more videos and learning. And I discovered that many mothers are envious of their daughter's beauty and success and mistreat and do not support them mentally or emotionally their entire lives. In turn, I have noticed that women at work treat a lot of the other women with disrespect. When I was in my 20s, I, I'm getting the chills again. I had a woman in her 40s that used to say to me every day, 
I cannot wait till you get pregnant and ruin your body. So I would hear this from her every day and I had coworkers who I still talk to 20 plus years later that still know this person. And we, she, I, I just remember now looking back that she was a narcissistic woman and I had no idea. So we're dealing with this in work environments, school environments, home environments, like co the community. And this is where women are now mistreating other women and don't even understand why they're doing it, where, where they picked it up, how it's happening. So this, I'm, you may be seeing this pattern too. I, I do remember too, when I had hent hunters and I was going for job interviews, they used to tell me to wear fake glasses and put my hair in a ponytail because if you were too good looking or pretty or certain style, they wouldn't want to hire you. They feel threatened by you. And this is where I feel like we really need to change um, society because women are actually hurting women versus when we lift each other up, we could become so much more powerful. So do you want to touch base on that? Sure. So some of this could be narcissistic personality disorder abuse uh, because narcissistic mothers are very envious of their children. Um, daughters, sons, it doesn't really matter. More daughters, I would think. It really kind of depends on what role you play in the family. Um, if you're the golden child, you're the scapegoat child, you're the invisible child. Um, like in my family, I was the golden child, so I was put up on a pedestal. My mother did not envy me. She adored me. She adorned me. You know, she showed me. It was really crazy. Um, but with my sisters, I saw like when they would have friendships, she was very jealous. Um, you know, you like your friends more than you like me. As far as the way it is in society, uh, I just think that we have a society of um, people who don't feel like they uh, measure up. And that is because we have all this social media and all these things that we're comparing ourselves to on a regular basis and we feel inadequate. And so when somebody seems to have more than us, whether it be looks, personality, education, uh, experience, uh, that's a threat. Women, I think by nature, tend to be this way because I know I have experienced this my entire life, going back to high school started in high school and um it's made me very uncomfortable um in a lot of situations because people assume i'm something that i'm not they judge me uh and a lot of times they don't really want to have anything to do with me they don't really know who i am but i think it's a societal problem uh and you know as you said it there is absolutely narcissism in the workplace it exists all the time. Um, it can be the coworkers, it can be uh, the bosses or the CEOs. And when you're working in an environment like that, it is, it destroys you. And then you have to weigh the, you know, I need this money, do I stay in the job? Or my mental health is deteriorating, do I go? Um, this is a dilemma a lot of people experience i can relate to that actually on several occasions in different scenarios and i didn't i wasn't able to identify it then sometimes it's after the fact when you get out of the toxic situation it's almost like a flood of energy like give comes towards you whether it's you know positive or the negative moving away it's like this gateway opens up of freedom and like a portal of positive health so um <laughs> This is why this information to help people understand more is imperative. I've got your book here, which as you can see, I've been tabbing it and I've been highlighting the heck out of this book. Uh, there is so much good knowledge and wisdom. So thank you. I, I gave you a great review on Amazon too, because thank that's you. where, you know, people look many times. And um, I know I've called you about some situations from time to time and you've done some really great guidance. And I've had friends now come to me asking, I need a good therapist or coach. So this is where I, I go, I'm going to bring this in because it's all, all generations I'm hearing this from. 
you know, women in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. And the fact is, I even see it now that I'm very aware of it and paying attention and learning more about it. I could see it in my friends. And I also thought, well, I had to have carried maybe some of these traits. I called my children and said, I'm really sorry if I did these things because I didn't know this is something that was, you know, I was around. Or um, so, yeah, so I was just learning a lot and trying to help get the word out and the message out for, you know, I hear one of my friend's mothers tell her how fat she is all the time. You're so you're putting on so much weight. You're so fat. And I'm just like, you know, that isn't nice to say. Why are you talking? Yeah. Like, why are you talking to your daughter and saying that in front of her, in front of me to her? I, you know, we, we're in, you know, we're not young little girls anymore and it's still being programmed all these decades. Right. So now she's got a complex, the mother's giving her, you know, it's going back and forth. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, and this is, this is, you know, this is objectification because when you're an adult <clears throat> and your parent is still trying to dictate how you live, the decisions that you make, how you look, so forth and so on. Um, that's because they don't care about you. They care about the image of you and how it reflects on them. So this is objectification. And um, when, you know, I just want to point out because when I ask people, have you, did you, have you suffered any kind of abuse? And they say, well, I was never hit. We're talking here about emotional, psychological abuse. And this kind of abuse can be far worse than physical abuse because with physical abuse, it's a tangible concept. You can see it happening. You experience it. You are there. Okay. With emotional abuse, it's under the radar. So you don't really know what's happening to you until it's almost too late till you have lost a, a large part of yourself. And then you, you don't really understand why, um, because the manipulations are, can be very covert. A lot of what a narcissist will do is not obvious. And we can often reason things away because there's always some plausibility to what happens. We can sort of find, some plausibility. And of course, um, narcissistic parents will absolutely deny that they do anything wrong. Every narcissist does that. They, they cannot accept that there's any flaws to them whatsoever, nothing. So this is, you know, so this is very, very damaging to a person. And, and because um, narcissistic parents, because they cannot accept their negativity they deflect it onto their children they deflect it onto their spouse their children um, and this happens in love relationships and in marriages as well yes i i mean i did hear even certain people say both their parents were narcissists so to have that doubly amplified impact on you holy smokes like that it was almost like a tag team on your soul as a young mm -hmm. kid or a, you know adolescent so i uh i wanted the the different types that you talk about in your book are the golden child the scapegoat the invisible child the hero and the caretaker can you cover those just so people sure. know where they're at i want them to just because mm -hmm. i knew where i fall <laughs> yes so there are there are roles that are assigned to children by narcissistic parents those roles are golden child, scapegoat, and potentially an invisible child. And the parent has to, there's only one golden child ever at a time. They can change, but there's only one. The golden child's job is to reflect perfection back to the parent. So if that child, if there's anything wrong with that child, then that means there's something wrong with the parent and there cannot be. So the parent holds that child in just such high esteem and they, um, they idolize, they idolize the child. The child can do no wrong. Sometimes this can even develop into, um, something called, um, uh, emotion. What is it called? Um, Emotional incest, that's what it is. Emotional incest. Um, a lot of times, narcissistic mothers will do this with their sons. Emotional incest 
is a intimate relationship that doesn't have sex. So narcissistic mothers will often try to get their needs met, even if there's a spouse in the, you know, there, they will often try to get their needs met through their sons. Um, and it's usually the golden sons and they treat them like surrogate spouses. And I'm telling you, these poor guys grow up and they are so messed up. Um, it's just so, so dangerous to do this to a child. But the scapegoat child is the dumping ground for everything that goes wrong with the parent, everything that goes wrong in the family. Because as I said, narcissists, they, they cannot possibly absorb that, they're neg that there's anything negative about them. It has to get off of them and onto somebody else. So anything that goes wrong, they will never take responsibility for it because they can't. Okay. Like the blind cannot see, a narcissist cannot take in negativity. They just can't do it. So the scapegoat child is the dumping ground. And, and that child, the message is to that child that you're a loser. You always have been, you always will be. Everything's your fault. And, you know, it's interesting because the, uh, the scapegoat child actually fares better in life than the golden child because the scapegoat child, they're living in an environment where they're damned if they do and they're damned if they don't. So they get very rebellious. They do speak up and that often helps them in life. They usually get away. They usually have a career. They usually get out. The golden child has a very hard time getting out because they're so enmeshed with the parent and they feel like they're responsible for that parent's every bit of happiness. Then you may have the, um, the invisible child. The invisible child is the, the parent just doesn't care. Sometimes they're neglected, but sometimes they're just not nurtured. They don't even pretend to nurture the child. It can go to extremes where they don't take care of the child physically, um, they don't take them to the doctor. Um, like for instance, I, my sister who was the invisible child, she had terrible acne, um, in adolescence. And my mother never took her to the dermatologist with me. I went to the doctor for everything, every little thing. Um, but my sister always felt invisible for her entire life and, uh, you know, well into her sixties and she passed in her sixties. So that's very all these roles are destructive not none are better than the other people think that the golden child has it better they do not have it better okay it's it's the same kind of impact on them they may hear words like i love you and i care about you and you're wonderful or you're beautiful or you're handsome but it's own it's never about the, the child it's about how they can make the parent look so then you have um roles that children adapt to in these homes. They're not assigned. They, they take these on in order to adapt to the situation. And you have the hero child. Um, you have the, res the responsible child. You have the manipulative child. Uh, you have the, um, the one who clowns around. And all of these are adapted to somehow um, accept the abuse that's going on because narcissistic abuse is a, a child under raised by a narcissistic parent will absolutely get psychotic because they don't have the, the processes to, to, to filter through this, to figure it out. And so it is, it destroys them. But fortunately, we have the subconscious mind and the subconscious mind's job is to make sure we're not devastated by these things. And so we adopt things So the child. You know, there's the child who takes on the responsibility for the family. They're always reliable, 100 um, percent. They never have a self. It's take care of everybody's needs because that kind of calms things down. Um, you have um, this, the, the child who is um, the clown, the mascot clown, who uses humor to bring levity to all the craziness in the family. And so they use humor. 
Um, these are roles that we actually do take into adulthood and we continue to use them. And we're usually not aware of what we're doing. Um, then you have, um, what were some of the other ones? The what are some of the other ones, Noah? The caretaker. Okay. All right. Um, the caretaker is making sure that everybody's needs are met at all times. Um, they're the one who jumps in and makes sure that the mom is okay, the dad's okay. And again, this is at the, um, they're sacrificing themselves. This is not a healthy role for a child to play. Uh, and this is where you get codependent codependent adults and things like that, because they learn in childhood that it's their responsibility to take care of everybody. So then they get into relationships and friendships and they continue to feel like they're only going to be loved if they are caretakers. Mm -hmm. um, and this is why so many of us growing up in these environments have this issue in our adult relationships. So it tends to fluctuate. You maybe are more dominant in one of them, right? But do you tend to find that people move through all of them at some point in their lives? I think so. I think so. Um, right and hearing it, you talk it really about just, it, it depends on how many children are in the family, what role you take on. Um, because, you know, a child who's a caretaker taker is never going to be a mascot or a clown. Mm -hmm. They're never going to be because they're approaching this in a very different way. Uh, the mascot clown is always using humor. They're making light of everything. But these are the comedians you see that end up depressed and committing suicide because mm. they're always making light of everything when inside. That's depressed. what they say about comedians, right? That they're okay. And mm -hmm. I have to actually share a story here because I've shared this with one other person and they had like an aha moment ripple through their body. And okay. this is why I want to share it. So I was walking around my neighborhood and I ran into my neighbor, my neighbor. His name is Brian Sumner. He is actually a world renowned professional skateboarder hmm. from like Europe. He's well known and he's turned into a pastor over the years. I'm getting the chills again. We, and I run into him from time to time and we always have this really interesting exchange, you know, um, and we're, we're in, in very unusual times. Some people have ideas of we're in possible end times. And so when I talk to him, it's always, uh, he, he gives me a little bit of information that I always end up just digesting. So when I saw him, he goes, what's new, Noel? And I said, well, I am, you know, I'm going through and understanding narcissism right now better. And he goes, okay, well, you know the story in the Bible. And I'm like, no, I can't tell you I do. And so he brought up the scapegoat. He goes back in the day, they talked about the scapegoat as being the animal. Everyone in the family or community put their hands on this animal to put their sins and their energy Ooh. into this particular animal. And I'm getting the chills again. And they, so they basically, this goat would be sent out to the forest to be slaughtered and take away all of their sins. Oh my gosh. And I'm getting the chills. Wow. So when I said this to another girl, she realized she was the scapegoat and this is actually what had been occurring. And so right now, I think we're at this pivotal moment in human evolution where we are to stop this generational programming that's been taking place. We are literally to cut it off and redirect it. And when we do that, we heal it in our timeline for the past, the present and the future. So this is actually, um, I had to bring this in because I'm hoping somebody else will hear this and it'll click for them like a, like a domino. We'll be just like all the dominoes will drop because now you're going to feel and see this pattern that's been carried through. Absolutely. So um, I actually want to ask you what you can cover when somebody decides to step away from the family and break the patterns, what they can expect to experience. Okay. That's a really good question. Um, so, you know, anybody that's looking into narcissistic abuse, they're going to hear no contact, low contact, all these terminologies that it's very hard to put them together and make sense out of it for your own life. Um, 
and boundaries come into this whole thing as well. So if you have parents that are, uh, there's no boundary between you and them. They just think they have full access to you all the time. They always have, they always will. Narcissistic parents don't want boundaries because that blocks them out. That, you know, you're not their property if, if you're setting up boundaries and they can't abuse you. So, um, so um, when you try to get away from a family, there's options, uh, boundary setting, low contact, no contact. And usually people want to skip over the whole boundary thing and the low contact and just go to no contact because they think they're going to feel better if they just get away, just erase these people from your life. But the problem with that is that if you don't go through the boundary setting and the low contact first, you will be riddled with guilt. And the reason you're going to be riddled with guilt is because you're always wondering what they're thinking, how they're being affected by what you did, um, because it's never been made clear. So, and even though they, the parent knows what they're doing, um, they're still going to pretend that they don't. They're still going to pretend that this child who's having, or adult child that's having a hard time with them is at fault completely. So, but the first thing is boundary setting because you have to figure out what it is that they're doing that is intolerable to you, that you refuse to accept in your life anymore. And when you do that, it needs to be stated in some way. Usually I like to say in writing because that way there's proof that it's been said. But boundaries don't exist without consequences. And so consequences are set for the first consequence is usually one that's easy for you to enforce, like you won't hear from me for two days or a week or whatever, something like that. Um, and then with each offense, because they're going to cross the boundaries, there's no doubt about it. They don't want boundaries between you and them. You keep making the consequences a little bit tougher and tougher, tougher. And so during this time, this is low contact or minimal contact where you are having this relationship trying to have it on your terms but it's not nothing is implied with a narcissist okay they don't understand what you're doing just because you know people will say to me well they must understand i haven't called in three weeks no they don't understand that that's not there's no implication that they understand they understand very concrete things you're either there for them to feed on or you're not that's it there's no in between but it but they may have to put up with your boundaries if there's something that they don't want to lose from you so if you have children they don't want to lose their grandchildren or you know if um if they have lived vicariously through you as the golden child they may not want to lose that, you know? So that's where the, the child has leverage. It's really important to go through, just quickly, it's really important to go through these processes because that way, when you decide you're done, you have made it very clear what this is about. And then when you go no contact, you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, what happens when you go no contact? You know, a lot of things happen, uh, and it really just depends. It depends on how you have set up this low contact thing and what you have established is the rules. So, um, you know, like I when I established this with my narcissistic mother, I said, because I was 42 when I began to figure this out. I was not very young. And I said to her for 42 years, we've been doing it your way and it's not working for me. Now it's my way, only my way. I'm going to decide how this relationship is going to go. I had her afraid of me. And listen, we don't necessarily want to make people afraid of us, but it's the only way to get a narcissist to somewhat behave because if they're not in fear of losing something, they're not going to behave. But by the time you go no contact, it's been it's pretty clear. That doesn't mean they're going to stop trying. And at that point, that's when you 
block things, you block numbers, you block texts, you send all emails to, um, to spam. Um, because just a little bit of them coming into your life is enough to trigger you. You take down photos, you absolutely erase this person from your life. And you don't do it out of anger and you don't do it out of resentment because at this point you're basically saying, I'm just not a part of this. Um, this is not my, fa I, I don't want to be a part of this. Go live your life, do what you want to do. I just don't want to be a part of it, you know? So, uh, but there's all kinds of things because sometimes parents will have a, go into frenzies um, and they'll call and they'll call and they'll call or they'll show up. I've even had uh, parents do um, well visit checks, well checks from the police on their children, where they send them, you know, say, "Oh, I haven't heard from my child. Please check and make sure they're okay." Um, they can go to all kinds of extremes. But once you've gone no, um, once you've gone no contact, you don't answer doors, you don't answer calls, you don't respond to any of these things, and so eventually they have to go away. That said. They will go away, but from time to time, they'll just pop in. There's no intervals, regular intervals. It'll just be like, all of a sudden you'll hear from them. Um, they're just always checking because they always think they have it over on you. And all they have to do is say the right thing and you'll be right back to them. Mm. Hmm. And it's funny too, and I say this with a lot of love, I. I've witnessed some women in my life. I see how they're answering for their children, their grown children, keeping them in the house till they're close to 30 years old, under their wing, under their thumb, you know, like you don't know better for yourself like I do, you know, or because they don't want to be alone or whatever their issues are. Mm -hmm. It's really, it's really interesting. And it's, I, sometimes I will just say, I'm going to give you some space or I need some space because I feel like we need to just grow apart for a while. Because when you heal or you shift your energy, you basically change your frequency. So when you elevate your frequency to a higher level and then you get around people who have kept that lower vibration or that stagnant mindset, it basically comes back and it inflicts it on you, right? And that's when we get triggered. So I do find, I understand why you're saying to just keep your space, um, keep your distance, maintain your peace because they will lash out and other family members may do things like you would never believe to deceive you or, you know, to hurt you or to make you look bad. They'll do things that you're just like unbelievable, but you just have to let it go because you know that they're not operating at the frequency or level you are. Right. And in my experience, when there's more than one child in a family, more than one sibling in a family, only one sibling gets clarity on this. Only one sibling rises up out of it. And then what happens is because in a family where there's more than one child, there are only crumbs to go around. The parents, whatever favors they're giving are crumbs. They're not real. And so when one child rises up and gives up their crumbs, what do the other kids do? They go in deeper. And this is when they will turn on the child who's trying to get healthy. Even if they know that the parents are highly abusive, even if they were abused even more, they will still resent the person for getting out um, and then sort of take their share. Wow. Okay, everybody, you have some processing to do. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. And it's, yeah, you know, and support I, can just, I can tell you these things, you know, um, but there's a, there's so many ins and outs of how this works and um, learning about their behavior, why they act the way they do and understanding that you have control, but you've been taught that you don't. Got it. Right. So you're taking back your control. I saw this uh, on one of your feeds and I want you to address this. And it was uh, narcissists and financial abuse. Can you talk about that topic too here, please? Sure. Um, everything with a narcissist is about control. And 
finances are one way that they can do this. Um, there's a lot of times it's very difficult to get out of family situations and adult relationships and marriages um, because the money has been controlled and you have very little say in it and they can manipulate you through money. So like in families, narcissistic parents will do things like they will have a family business and pull you in. So they are in charge of your income. And should you leave them, you have no income. This is financial abuse. Um, they often will go into uh, buying property or investments together with their children. You know, let's do this together, father, son, mother, daughter, whatever it is. They're doing this because they want to lock you in so that you can't get away so easily. Everything is made to trap you. And there's absolutely uh there's there's no exception to this rule everything they do is to trap you somehow and keep you from getting away from them so um husbands will take care of all the money the finances um the wife has absolutely nothing so when she's had it and she's ready to go she can't because she has no access to the money she has no money and she's been put in a situation. A lot of times um, narcissistic uh, spouses will, especially husbands, will talk their wives out of um, or, or talk them into quitting their careers, not finishing up with college because they don't want them to be self-sufficient. So financial abuse is really about control. Um, and so when you get into a relationship, you have to make sure that you are on equal terms financially. And if that's not happening, um, down the road, this could be a problem because any legitimate spouse that cares about their, their, you know, like my husband, he puts my name on every, he doesn't even ask me. My name's on absolutely everything. I know about everything. And, but I was in a situation, um, when I was younger, I was married to somebody who gave me nothing. And when I had to leave, I had to leave penniless and homeless. Um, you know, so is there anything else about financial abuse specifically, Noel, that you wanted to ask me? You know, I'm actually super glad you covered this about spouses because I actually wrote about that in my book of when you're married, you should always have your own account no matter what, even if you stay home as a mom, find a little side gig to at least have a little income coming in, whether it's walking dogs or house sitting or doing something, because you do not want to be held captive under someone's thumb controlling you financially. Because I think a lot of people are in relationships because A, they A, don't want to be alone or B, financial reasons. In fact, I know people have stayed together and married or picked a partner due to financial reasons alone. And then they were unhealthy and turned out to get really sick in the end. And they were just living with someone and being with someone because they were scared of the alternative, right. but not realizing how much more impactful the situation they were currently in was or is. Right. So in order to maintain to, in yeah, integrity. We to make any of our decisions fear, that are fear-based. If it's right. fear-based, it's not going to work. We need to be empowered with our decisions. So... So, yeah. Can you hear? I don't know if you can hear that, but they're practicing for the air show above my head right now. Oh, no, I can't. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> so they're kind of going in and out. Let's see. I wanted to ask you, what are you witnessing with your clients? The befores and afters. Why don't you give us some success stories so people can have some positivity to focus on or look toward? Okay. All right. So. Um, uh, one of the most dramatic things I can I can talk about was a client who came to me. She was in her early 60s. She had had an amazing career. She was well respected in her community, and she could get any job that she wanted. And she married late and decided she wanted a child, so she adopted one from a foreign country. 
she did this as a single parent, raised this child for a couple of years. And then this narcissistic man got a hold of her. Of course, she didn't know that he was narcissistic, but he was. And when she could take it no more in this marriage, she walked away intending to come back and get her daughter. But he used that to destroy her. He had her put in a mental institution. He had, um, he took away all her finances. He took away her property. He took away her daughter. He turned the daughter against her. And so here she was in her sixties, early sixties. And she's like, Brandy, I'm driving around with antifreeze in the back seat, and I'm going to drink it at some moment because I have lost absolutely everything. So we worked together on this and we actually addressed the issue of control and how we really have no control in our lives and how we have to somehow go with the flow, uh, which is a minute part of the work that we did. But through this working together uh, weekly, bi-weekly, as much as she needed, um, by the end of like, I would say six months, she was reunited with her daughter. She won the case in court against her husband. She got everything that she wanted. She's now living independently. She's got a job. She was offered a job. She's doing everything that she thought she'd never do in her life. A lot of times, um, what I see a lot is people who will say to me, um, but can I really be who I am? Is that really okay? You know, what if, what if who I am is not acceptable? And I do a lot of work around that where I help people to understand their, their value um, and how they have the right to be who they are. But people will say to me very often, really, I can just be who I am? which seems strange to some people, and it may not seem strange to others. But a lot of the work that I do is really building the tools that they did not get. And often it's that they did not get in childhood. They don't have the self-love. They don't have the self-esteem. And they don't think they have, you know, they don't think they have any worth in life. They think that their life is a sacrificial one to take care of other people. Um, you know, I'm very patient with people because there's something called cognitive dissonance that happens in narcissistic abuse. Cognitive dissonance is where when there's two opposite thoughts, two thoughts collide, our minds cannot do that. So they will always default to the one that seems more familiar, more grooved in, we're used to it. So with narcissistic abuse, it's very hard to get past what they've been programmed and to put in new programming, a different way of thinking. It takes a lot of patience. It takes a lot of repetitiveness. Um, it takes setbacks and, you know, peaks and valleys. Um, but I have had some remarkable, remarkable, remarkable things. I mean, I, uh, there was a woman who she just couldn't stand up to her father, a grown woman, grandmother. She couldn't stand up to her father and her mother was um, losing her mind. You know, she had senility and she wanted to see her mother, but the father was the gatekeeper and she was terrified of him. But we worked through this. She set the boundary. She did what she needed to do and she moved forward in her life. And it also was impacting her marriage because she was allowing her husband to um, to do the kind of control her, do the same thing. And she stood up for herself. And then the other one I want to tell you, I had a woman who was originally from a tribe in Africa because I deal with people all over the world. She was living in the UK and she was brilliant. She had a great career uh, in the medical field and she was highly respected, but she thought she was an absolute nobody because her mother growing up always told her that she was a nobody and a nothing useless, you know. And we worked on this and eventually she took her power back and she said to me, I'm going back to this tribe in Africa 
And I'm now going to teach this to other people. So that was a really amazing thing to me. Um, you know, because a lot of this is ethnic. You know, there are certain ethnicities that are more male dominant, more female dominant, whatever it is. And it's pretty hard to cut through those things. But I've had a tremendous amount of success stories um, because I don't give up. I love that. <laughs> That's good. We need someone to believe in us so we can believe in ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I've gotten to the point where I always am telling myself, I love you all the time out loud. I, I sometimes do it in the mirror, but I mean, I'll just be walking and I'll bur burst it out. <laughs> That's so good. That's so and good. I started telling other people that I go, you know what I do? I tell myself, I love you, Noelle. And they're like, I'm going to take that and use it. I'm all good. That's why I just told you that. So they're reaping benefits from it too. I mean, you know, people, you know, we're taught, oh, you're selfish if you self-love, but you have to love yourself first to be able to give out love and to have your cup filled. Right. Selfishness is depriving somebody of something and taking it for yourself. Self-love mm -hmm. doesn't do that. Nobody's deprived of anything. As a matter of fact, the more you fill your well with love, the more you have to give out. It just flowing. But when you don't take care of yourself, you're going to con you're going to be a giver you're going to be a doer you're going to be a helper but you're always going to be drained and exhausted and frustrated mm -hmm. and resentful because you're not getting it back you've got to give to yourself first and that whether you have children whether you have a spouse it doesn't matter what your role is you've got to give to yourself first if you want to be effective in giving to others huh that's true i have to ask you randy what is your superpower My superpower is my belief that I'm not here alone. My superpower is my belief that I have divine, the divine, whatever that may be, whether it be angels or guides or <clears throat> people that have crossed over, that they're always with me and they're always whispering to me. And so I never fear because I know I'm not here by myself. And this is a really important point, I think, to make for people. Um, when you feel like this is all there is and you're all there is, that can be terrifying. Um, and so I'm not afraid of death. I, and I also, because of this um, spiritual belief that I have, I know that I'm a soul. I've been around many, many times. I know I'm here to learn more or to accomplish more or whatever. And so when... I'm faced with something that seems insurmountable. That's when I dig in and do it because I know anytime it in, feels insurmountable, it's what I came here to do as a soul. And so I fearlessly push past it until I get past it. But I think it's important to have some belief that you're not here alone, that you're more than what you think you are. Good to know. We have a whole team on the other side working with us. If we, <laughs> if we listen and connect, yes, they're rooting for us. <laughs> they are. They're always whispering in our ears. Always. Mm -hmm. Whether we choose to hear it or not is another thing. But right. Okay. But and then, there. Yes. Yes. I'm glad you're confirming that for people who get those taps on the shoulders or the whispers in their ears. It's. It's not you're thinking you're crazy. It's them trying to guide you. I have one last question before I ask how people can find you, but it's all over your billboard behind you. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, I want to know what your message to the universe is. This is like your ultimate chance to share with the entire universe your whatever's really important that you want to be remembered for and like your legacy, I guess you could say. You know... No pressure. It took me a long time, probably five decades or more, to figure out what I was here to do. I, I always, uh, I thought parenting was the the most important thing I could ever do, and I did that well, and I did it for a long time. Um, but I always knew there was something more here, and 
I believe this is how I see kind of the universe and, and how we all fit into it. Um, I think of it like a great big jigsaw puzzle and that every one of us, every piece in the puzzle is a completely different shape. And those shapes represent each soul that's here. And the picture does not come together unless all of the pieces are there. And so I think it's important that we understand how so very important, how very valuable, how we are so important to the whole picture of who of of mankind, womankind, people kind, whatever it is. Um, we're so important to this whole picture and that we're all kind of in this together. Uh, and what we do affects other people. And I, I just really think that we need to um, focus on things in terms of being a whole, but realizing the importance of ourselves as a part of the whole. Hmm. Well, there you have it. Knowledge and wisdom from around the world with Miss Randy Fine. Thank you for <laughs> joining us today. I hope we gave you something, a tidbit or a little aha moment or whatever you needed to hear came through to you and something resonated or made you click. Please go dive deeper into this topic if you want to learn more about it or reach out to Randy. She's a great wealth of knowledge and resources and she she knows how to guide you and coach you and listen to you and you know help you through the process. So thanks for having coming and joining us today and thank you Miss Randy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Noel. I'm so appreciative that you invited me on. And I'm really always happy to talk about this topic. I hope we taught you more about narcissism today and maybe open the door a little more for you to do your own research. I wanted to put Randy's book up again, Close Encounters of the Worst Kind. She also told me off the record after our recording that she has a workbook that you can do as well. And it's journaling your way through, which I highly would recommend because as you journal, you heal bits of your soul. So go ahead, tell more people about this, talk about it because that's what we're here to do is heal our genetic patterns and leave a new legacy for this human evolution of the new earth, reaching towards ascension. 